thank you for that. And uh, welcome to the 19th Century Charitable Association. We're pleased that you are able to share this program with us today. Right now, Diane Moses has a few words to say, if you just hold on. I just wanted to tell you that our program next week, our music program is called I Did It My Way. Two performers that are fantastic singing Frank Sinatra type of music. I Did It My Way next Monday. Thank you. Thank you. In respect for our speaker and those around you, we kindly request that you turn off or silence your cell phones. Thank you. Our mission is to strengthen our community through learning, giving, and sharing our landmark building. We would like to thank uh, the social program series sponsor, Kelty Financial Services. Have you managed to silence that device yet? <laughs> Good, just checking for a friend. Today we are pleased to welcome Dr. Roy Plotnick, who is, uh, slightly under 24 hours ago agreed to cover the opening made available by uh, the unavoidable absence of Dr. Chapel Magruder. Dr. Plotnick's le le lecture is entitled Explorers of Deep Time. Usually at this time we give a short recap of what the lecture would include, uh, but we don't know that. So. In this case, I'm going to read a literary reference from Louisa May Alcott's Little Women that Dr. Plotnick included with his bio info. And I hope I can do it justice. The scientific celebrities, forgetting their mollusks and glacial periods, gossiped about art while devoting themselves to oysters and ices with characteristic energy. Dr. Plotnick is Professor Emeritus at the University of Illinois at Chicago. He's a fellow of both the Geological Society of America and the Paleontological Society and was an Edward P. Bass Distinguished Visiting Scholar at Yale University. He's long been involved uh, with efforts to increase public interest and awareness in paleontology and the earth sciences. Roy is the author of the uh, newly released book, Explorers of Deep Time, Paleontologists and the History of Life, published by Columbia University Press. Please welcome Dr. Roy Plotnick. So there are a lot of things about the field. One of the reasons I wrote the book that, I'll, that, uh, that I did is to try to address some of these misconceptions about us. So again, if you ask somebody, you know, what do paleontologists study? You're going to get back, oh yes, you study dinosaurs. Yeah, a lot of us do, but in reality, most of us don't. Most paleontologists study things that are not dinosaurs. So this lovely piece of artwork here shows what, well, where you're sitting would have been like in the Ordovician. And I have some fossils in the back near my book out there from that period of time. This is hundreds of millions of years before there were dinosaurs on Earth. But these are the living things that remain there, and we are, this is the kinds of things um, that we're interested in. In fact, uh, I'll point out this, that one right there. Uh, that's the thing I did my doctoral dissertation on, and it's, it's not a dinosaur. I'll talk about that in a moment. So what most of us really study is pretty much anything that ever lived on the earth that left some sort of remains of its existence behind is what a paleontologist is studying. Anything about the history of life on earth, be it a clam, a brachiopod, the ammonoids over there, various kinds of crustaceans, sea stars, trilobites, and I, again, I have one, a trilobite fossil back there. Can anybody see it? Let's look at it at the end here. So, so what do we study? We study any, any living thing that leaves behind fossils. We study what fossils tell us about life on Earth in the ancient past. We study 
how and why life on Earth has changed over time, the study of evolution. And we also, many of us, myself included, are very interested, what lessons does this have for what's going to happen in the future, especially nowadays, given our many environmental concerns? So, what's a fossil? Okay, I want to be very clear here. You don't have to be altered, changed, petrified somehow whether to be a fossil. A fossil is just simply a remain of a living thing. So it could include bones and teeth like this mastodon, which is the perimastodon, which is at Wheaton College. It could be shells, various kinds of seashells of various kinds. Our major evidence for changing life in the oceans is going to come from shells. Also, our major evidence for changing climate of the oceans comes from shells. Leaves and pollen. Again, uh, one of the leaf here I show is from the Maison Creek, which is a famous fossil site just uh, southwest of Chicago. And I have a couple of fossils from that in the back here. And pollen, again, major evidence for ch climate change even over the last several thousands of years. And it doesn't have to be a physical hard part or remain of what the fossil was. It could be a footprint, a track, a trail. So you see here the horseshoe crab walking over the sand flat. We have fossils of those trails with a dead horseshoe crab at the end of it. Um, various footprints of things. This is our best record we have of the history of behavior of animals over time. But when I really, people ask me what it is that paleontologists do, we are time travelers. We do it mentally, but we go back and using the evidence we find and our best scientific knowledge, try to reconstruct what life on Earth, the Earth itself was like in the past. We don't have a TARDIS, we don't have a, the HG Well time machine, but we are to very large extent mental time travelers. So, why do we study fossils? Why do we make these, these trips back in time? Um, first of all, this, the fossil record is the, some of the best direct evidence and has always has been for the evolution of life on Earth. That life has a history. I say, what is the definition of evolution? It is the idea that life has a history. That the things we find in the rocks of the Earth, in the sediments of the Earth, are things that are no longer around. And that new things appear and old things disappear. That we want to know where, uh, uh, where organisms of today came from. So we have here Archaeopteryx from the Jurassic, the first, a dinosaur like, a bird like dinosaur is the best way to put this. We know that birds are actually our dinosaurs and we have evidence from this from Archaeopteryx leading to this hawk that we had in my backyard just uh, last year. And we can see that transition. And I show here a coal forest from the Maison Creek area a nice warm tropical forest that we had right here in Illinois, no longer around, but we know that there's no flowers there. Life has changed and our fossil record is the best evidence we have, direct evidence for that history. We know that the earth, the physical earth has changed too. We know that um, the continents were in different positions over time, that they came together, they separated. We know that ice has advanced over the Earth. So where you are sitting now, if you were sitting where you are 21,000 years ago, it would have looked like Antarctica does today. We had about a half mile of ice, kilometer of ice, over your heads today. So global climates have changed. Global environments have changed. It is... Um, the fossil record that tells us, in many cases, how, what the climate was, what the geography was, but it also tells us what happened to life on Earth when these things happened. Or as I like to tell people, we really are the people, if you want to know what happens when things go bad, when environmental change occur, paleontologists are the ones who know. The best model we have, for example, of what's going to happen with the warming climates today is something called the Paleocene-Eothene Thermal Maximum, which happened about 50 million years ago. And we are actively studying to see what happened in that 
during that period of time when temperatures on the Earth suddenly spiked. It gives us a clue. So that leads to extinction. Though, except for the birds, or as, uh, the dinosaurs are extinct, or the, my, some colleagues call it the non-avian dinosaurs are gone. And you don't see any mastodons rolling around here. So we know, for example, that the extinction of the dinosaurs was caused when an asteroid hit the Earth 66 million years ago in the, what is now the Yucatan. In terms of the mammoths and the mastodons, uh, we know that they were, until about 10,000 years ago, there were still mammoths on, in North America. And if you want to get people arguing among themselves in the, in the scientific community, with anthropologists, archaeologists, paleontologists all arguing, you can argue what caused that extinction of the giant, gigantic ground sloths and the mammoths and the mastodons. Because some people feel it's the Earth got warm, climate change. Other people felt some of these extinctions didn't happen until humans arrived in those areas. And maybe it was both. But it's a big source of argument, and it's kind of fun. And for those who don't know, if you, uh, if, if you remember, remember the Hemingway Museum that was here? I was visiting it, and I noticed that there was a display about where Hemingway spent his time as a child, and there was a little dot mammoth tooth and it said, courtesy of the Forest Park Public Library. And I went, what? So I went over to the Forest Park Public Library, and on display was a tusk and teeth from a mammoth that was uh, found in about 1855 in a gravel bank, about 10 feet down along the Des Plaines River. So you. Um, you were sitting where you are about you know, 14,000 years ago, you might have seen an animal like that wandering around. And uh, the article I found out that discussed the, in the newspaper that discussed this uh, discovery, I think was a presentation, was at, a, at to the 19th century women's club around, 18, you know, around 1900 or something. I'd have to go find the exact, so. Part of the book and part of a lot of what I want to talk about is first of all, how did I become a paleontologist? And I wanted to be an astronomer when I was a kid. Now, I always thought that, you know, uh, this was my telescope here. I wanted to be an astronomer. But as Sandra could tell you, it's hard to see stars from the Bronx. <laughs> and I also discovered that an astronomer is an astrophysicist, is a physicist, is a mathematician. And you have to be able to think about the universe as a math in mathematical terms. My son, who's a physicist, can do this. I couldn't. So I started out at Columbia University as a uh, biology major. I quickly learned that biology today is all molecular biology and genetics, which I was really not interested in. I was interested in animals and plants and things like that. I was also interested in geology. I'd learned about a time that the Mediterranean had dried up. And so during my freshman year, I was working as a work study student at a blood bank. Now, what are you going to let a 17-year-old do at a blood bank? Nothing, because if he makes a mistake, somebody's going to die. So I read an article in the Natural History magazine by Niles Eldridge, who was a uh, at that time, a young paleontologist at the American Museum of Natural History about trilobites. And I said, that's actually kind of interesting. And I told my mother. And she said, call him up and see if he has a job for you. <laughs> and he did. Turns out a work study job had just become available. And um, so I, he did. And I say, listen to, always I tell people, you listen to your mother. So I became a geology major with a work study job. Uh, after graduating uh, Columbia, I went on and got my master's at the University of Rochester. I got my PhD at the University of Chicago. I was at UIC from 1982 to 2020, and I still own telescopes, and I still can't see stars in Oak Park. <laughs> but at least I can now drive a car and go to where I can see them. 
So one of the things I talk about in the book is I thought this was a weird, you know, I, I assumed that most paleontologists would say, I always wanted to study dinosaurs, or I grew up where we could collect fossils, and it turns out that my story is not unusual. People find many, many pathways to deciding they want to study the history of life. So what it is do, do we study? As I said, we study not just dinosaurs. We study many different things. So my doctoral thesis was on this group of animals over here, which are called uh, Eurypterids, but more common, uh, popular name is sea scorpions, distant relatives of the modern horseshoe crab and of the spiders and scorpions. Uh, and that particular one got to be about six feet long, some of the largest arthropods of all time. And you can see uh, there's a, uh, s somebody made a nice big stuffy model of it that you can see threatening me over there. I have a sm much smaller one at home. But um, I actually, many years I, after my thesis, I didn't work on them, but I am now back working on them again, and they are just a fascinating group of creatures. Um, I'm also interested in ancient sense organs. I'm interested in behavior how about behavior has changed over time, and how do organisms detect their environment. And this, I always think this is one of those weird little factoids one learns sometimes. Crickets have their ears on their legs. You can, crickets and katydids. If you ever see one, you can see there's a little oval area on their legs where they have an ear. And it turns out, from this fossil from 50 million years ago from Colorado, you can find the ears, which means that back 50 million years ago, around this, this lake that existed at that time, you would have the sound of crickets. More recently, um, oops, oh, the, uh, okay, I'll have to, the text part didn't come up here. Um, this, organ, this fossil up here is from the Maison Creek, which is our local famous site for fossil collections. Uh, it's very rare to have things preserved that are not, that are soft bodied, they don't have shells or bones. But Maison Creek is famous for that. Uh, I have a fossil leaf back there and a fossil worm that I, I put in the back table there. So this creature here was described in, is the most common animal in Maison Creek. And in 1975, it was described as a jellyfish. And it turns out, if you kind of imagine, turn it upside down in your head, it turns out it's not a jellyfish. It has never been a It makes no sense as a jellyfish. It is a sea anemone. And it is the only common sea anemone in the entire history of fossil record of life. So the paper on this went in Monday, last week. <laughs> so there's a lot of other stuff I work on, but there's just a taste of what I've been doing recently. So where do you go to study fossils? Okay, one of the things I like to tell people is that the nice thing about paleontology, geology too, and some areas of ecology, this is a case where you can do science and you don't have to be stuck indoors. This is science you can do out in the field and you can go to all sorts of parts of the world to go do your science. So these are, this is actually right, uh, this is in La Salle, but the other one's in Newfoundland. So you can travel to quite a few places in the world. But I'm going to just focus here on the local area. And this is, again, how we do these mental time trips. This is the Ordovician. It's a reconstruction of the Ordovician time 460 million years ago. These giant creatures around here are called nautiloids. They are relatives of the modern nautilus. Think of a squid stuck into, or an octopus stuck into a shell. And again, I have a fossil of one of these in the back table there. Um, these got to be 15 feet long, quite, quite large animals. This is one of the trilobites going around here. But that's what we would have had here at this time at 460 million years ago. And we know that because if you drill a hole down below where we're sitting, go down deep enough, you'll find rocks of that age, or you can go out west and visit quarries. And this is a quarry uh, 
near DeKalb, where we often would take our students to go collect fossils. And a lot of the rocks in that area are all of Ordovician age, and you find the fossils from that age. 420 million years ago, 40 million years later, we would have had an area that looked like this. And you'll notice there are corals and things like that. This was a period of time where we had great reefs throughout the world, including, if you go down to the south side, about 183rd Street in Halstead, right along the Tri-State Expressway, there's the gigantic Thornton Quarry. And that is in an ancient reef. The entire bedrock of the Chicago area, what all the massive buildings are built into, and in places if you look around, you can find them, quarries in the area. There's ones just south uh, of here. If you go down like First Avenue, you'll see quarries. All those quarries in this area are in the Silurian, of rocks of 420 million years ago. Bouncing ahead 100, uh, to 305 million years ago, we go to the Pennsylvanian, and we have tropical swamps and forests that were buried and became coal. Why do we have so much coal in Illinois? Because we had these forests here at that time. So here is a reconstruction at the Field Museum that we one might find with giant fish there. And then we can go out, and this is along the banks of the Maison River in Will County. And that is a site where many, uh, a famous fossil site where rocks of that age can come from. So we have these, this, these sites that we can go to that tell us that this is what things were like. Um, here, and this is actually, I, I love this story because this is, sometimes you have serendipity. You have something happened that you just sort of say, I didn't expect that. So most of the rocks in the Chicago area are covered by roads and fields and things, and you can't find rocks. So you go to quarries. And I was reading uh, an article, a uh, uh, publication, and it said that out near Morris, Illinois, there was a quarry in the Ordovician, and it had fossils in it. So I got together with some of my students, and we went out to that quarry. And the quarry was supposed to be limestone. And in the middle of all that was this big mass of black material full of sand and mud and fossil plant remains. And we made this, we looked at it and said, this makes absolutely no sense. And we looked at it more and we said, well, if you look at it, on the sides is limestone, and on the top is limestone, and on the bottom is limestone, and how did you get all the sand and mud in the middle of the limestone? And this particular graduate student looked at it and said, that's a cave. And what happened was, Again, all of this area was covered by shallow seas, which made limestone. At about 300 million years ago, we had an ice age in the far southern hemisphere. Sea levels dropped. All those limestones became exposed. It rained. Caves formed. Then rivers came over the area and filled in the caves. And they carried with them plants, including this little sprig here, which is one of the oldest conifers in the world. And you can see that specimen on display at, at the Field Museum if you're interested. Um, so we discovered this, this particular cave, uh, and it preserved the oldest chitin, which is the material that, uh, plant, uh, that animals are made out of, the oldest spore pollenin, which is the coating for spores that exists in the world, some of the oldest conifers in the world, just amazing stuff. And it's all sort of like sheer accident. We didn't know we were going to find it. So I got interested in caves and uh, working with, uh, with one of my graduate students, started going into caves and trying to see how things were preserved in caves. It was an excuse to learn something. I knew nothing about caves before I discovered this. It's wonderful to learn something new. Did a lot of research on how fossils would preserve in cave environments. So the field, but also museums. There, there are tremendous amount of things in museums. That uh, sea anemone I mentioned, there are thousands of specimens of that at the Field Museum collected by local amateur paleontologists. And you can actually buy, actually bought specimens of this at flea markets for like a couple bucks. There's no reason 
for me to go out and collect more of them. I can go to the museum and see them. So museums are filled with millions of fossils of, that have been collected by scientists over the last couple of centuries. And they are just an amazing place to spend time, pull open a drawer, look what's there, see what's there. We also study fossils in laboratories and in our offices. So that was, it still is my office at the University of Illinois at Chicago, and that's my computer, which has changed over the years to be more and more updated, as I, as I have also. <laughs> um, this is in my laboratory. It's my microscope setup. That microscope setup um, costs more than my car <laughs> by quite a lot. But I can use it to take photographs, for example, of this minute fossil spider in amber. So we have technological, I don't have to use a camera anymore, which takes film and then work. I have digital, it's just wonderful. <laughs> love, love, the, I am a really, love, the new technology has really changed things. In fact, I think more than anything else, I'd like to point out, or one of the things I'd like to point out is, yes, we go out there with the hammers and we go out there with the, the wisp rooms, we go out there with the little tools. But when we bring the stuff back, we use the most current high technological equipment. So there are people who work with synchrotron radiation at the advanced photon source at Argonne. And they're able to get pictures of fossil ants. Or they use various things called uh, CT scanners, micro CT scanners, which are basically like x-rays, but they take multiple layers. And the nice thing about that is that you can look at what's inside the rock without having to spend all the time removing it. And for fragile fossils, that's dangerous. So you can look what's inside, and that is a dinosaur embryo inside an egg, <coughs> revealed by micro CT scanning. So this is, Paleontology is as high tech as any other field. And we use big data. Well, again, compared to people in astronomy or meteorology, may not be big data, but we have, there are people who put together something called the Paleobiology Database. Paleobiology Database is a compilation of pretty much all the fossil collections that have been, we have spent time putting in. So hundreds of thousands of fossils, where they're found, how old they are, what are they with? And with that kind of information, we can then do very sophisticated computer analyses and start unraveling the overall big patterns in the history of life. So a lot of my colleagues don't look at fossils at all. They spend their entire time using Bayesian statistics to do priors and posteriors on, on, on the history of life. But one of the things that came up, this is an early study using this kind of big data, um, let me just go over what this diagram is telling us. Time going from here to there. Going up is the number of families of marine organisms. So this is the biggest picture available of the history of life. This was done back in the 80s. We can see the, the early rise in the Cambrian, the jump in the Ordovician, and then one, two, three, four, five labeled times when the number of organisms on the Earth dropped. The Ordovician, the Devonian, the end of the Permian, which is the big one, and then a Triassic, and then number five, which is the one when the dinosaurs went out. Five major mass extinctions, which have kind of become established as what we talk about. And some of you may have seen um, Elizabeth Colbert's amazing book, The Sixth Extinction. So what is the, so we have to say sixth, what are the five? That's what we got from the fossil record. Those are major marine extinctions that are going on today. So uh, the sixth extinction is today's extinction. It is the extinction of the dodo and the passenger pigeon, the thylacine. Unfortunately, probably pretty soon the right rhino. So we can put, this again what paleontologists can do, we can ask how is the extinction of today similar to or different from what has happened in the past? And this is actually part of my own research. 
turns out that of all the species of mammals, for example, that are threatened with extinction today, only 19% of them will leave a fossil record. So not only will they be gone, we'll never know they ever existed. And also part of my own research is just simply asking a question, what is going to be there? If I'm a paleontologist somewhere in the far future, a million years from now, what would the fossil record look like? And it's easy. It's going to be chickens and cows <laughs> and pigs and us. 90, well over 90 percent of the mammalian biomass on Earth today is us and our livestock. Wild animals have very little chance of ever appearing in the future fossil record because of changes in farming, of just how things are. And the humans, of course, are all going to be lined up in complete skeletons. So we do research, and many of us are also teachers. So uh, this is uh, the last time I taught paleontology, just before, which was the, the, the when COVID hit. And uh, we are uh, doing a game about fossil preservation. I had uh, a PhD student and uh, two master's students. My PhD student is now doing a postdoc in Poland. Um, we also do, like I'm doing here, a lot of us do public outreach. Um, this was a project I did through the Peggy Nodebart Nature Museum, and we took the kids to the, the, the rocks along the beach there, and there, it turns out there are fossils in the limestones along the beach that one can find and show them here. And the other thing, too, is that, um, and again, I spent a lot of time in the book about this, we also have families. You have to pay the rent. You have to send our kids to school. You have to drive cars. You know, this, this, one of my colleagues would go crazy when somebody says, oh, yeah, you guys don't know what it's like in real life. Yeah, we do. <laughs> we do. We're, we're in real life. We have the same service that everybody else has of trying to get by in life. And we have hobbies. So um, I'm a toy train collector, American Flyer mostly, uh, and I run them. But I also am, and this is a very bizarre thing, I am the world's expert on the little engine that could story. <laughs> long, long story about that, but there was, never was a Waddy Piper. He never existed. I can go over the rest of it some other time. Uh, so I'd like to finish off by sort of introducing some of my uh, real and um, fictional colleagues. Okay, so you, 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 you sit there, and I, is, I tell the story in the book. We, I was in a bar with some colleagues of mine, uh, fem two female colleagues, as it turns out, and the bartender asked us, what do you guys do? And we said, uh, we're paleontologists. And she goes, oh, just like Ross. <laughs> yeah, okay. You know, that, that, that's going to get dated eventually, I guess, but, you know, Ross, if you ever watch anything he does with paleontology, he I don't know how the guy got a job, but let alone keep it, or didn't get charged with sexual harassment. I just don't. Or they may talk about Sam Neill in, in, the, first, in the first Jurassic Park movie. I understand he's come back in the most recent one, he's coming back. Or I really like the fact of Laura Dern uh, as a paleobotanist. Yes, as a woman, it's wonderful. Um, or they will say, just like Indiana Jones. No. He is an archaeologist and a murderer and a, a somebody who committed theft of cultural uh, materials. And as far as we know, why he would have ever kept his job either, who knows. But not, not a paleontologist. There are a whole bunch of real paleontologists we can lay credit to. Darwin was a paleontologist. He collected, he collected fossil mammals in South America. Uh, the famous Cope and Marsh, who discovered many of the famous dinosaurs that all your kids know. And let me, by the way, mention, uh, it, it, every seven-year-old could say words like Pachycephalosaurus, Diplodocus. Kids, dinosaurs are a tremendous way for kids to learn 
Latin, I guess, but also just learn science. Kids are tremendously capable of learning. The fact that they can remember these long Latin names to tell you how they ate is just wonderful. But Cope and Marsh were the, what do they call the, the bone wars? Roy Chapman Andrews, the real Indiana Jones. Um, the reason he has a gun is because he's in China and it was the age of the warlords. Uh, George Gaylord Simpson, who was very ways the founder of the idea that we don't have to have, uh, we can look at big pictures of the history of life. Uh, my grand professor, Stephen Jay Gould, probably the most famous popularizer of, of science uh, for in, this, in recent years. Uh, Jack Horner, Robert Bacher, who, again, anybody who is a kid who about Palin Hill knows this guy. That's the stereotype. Yeah. Right there, with a beard. I can't get around that. But also, two good friends of mine who I've published, who I've worked with and published with, Susan Kidwell, Kay Barensmeyer, who work on fossil preservation. We've actually had a presidential paleontologist, though he, which was Thomas Jefferson, who descri described uh, the remains of a giant ground sloth, though he didn't recognize it as such. Some of you may have heard of the movie Ammonite. But Mary Anning, uh, total fiction. We have no idea about her sexuality. But she's discovered many ichthyosaurs and plesiosaurs along the seashore in Lyme Regis. And now some just want to talk briefly about some of my own, uh, own colleagues. Uh, Lisa Park Bausch is at University of Connecticut. She studies ancient lakes. That's where the toy train show. Uh, Lisa White is at uh, University of, uh, uh, at Berkeley, uh, education there, and that's ho us holding up some stuffies we have. Of, there's a whole line of fossil stuffies. If anybody has kids and wants to get these, I can give you the information. Um, Dina Smith Nufio, who is uh, a Latina uh, from California, who is now uh, the director of, uh, of sedimentary geology at, um, and paleontology at the National Science Foundation. Pedro Marenko's family came from Nicaragua, studies early life. Uh, Tom Holtz is one of the uh, dinosaur experts, expert on T-Rex. My colleague uh, Jessica Theodore works on fossil mammals. And one of the reasons I put these up, just as fun of this, I had a colleague who posted on Facebook a question. My uh, student was asking if brachiopods, which is a kind of shellfish, were kosher. <laughs> And we all responded, no, they're not. <laughs> but Jess, I'm Jewish, Jess Theodore is also Jewish, and she works in fossil mammals. And she says she'd have relatives who would ask, so, new no, Jess, is this kosher? <laughs> so the three of us, Tom, Jess, and I, wrote a paper for, the journal, uh, for a journal entitled Jurassic Pork. <laughs> what could a Jewish time traveler eat? <laughs> and the question was, how would a paleontologist answer this question? Was this particular fossil a kosher animal or not? What were the kind of evidence we would do? It's a way of, t we wanted to get past Genesis and all these arguments about the Bible. <laughs> Let's get to Leviticus. Uh, my colleague, Ann Weil, works on dinosaurs and mammals. Uh, she's out of Oklahoma. Um, I want to give, always give a lot of props to paleontological artists, paleo artists. This is the amazing Ray Troll uh, in his own artwork, trollart.com. And um, again, in one of the chapters in the book, I discuss at length the contributions of artists because they are the ones who bring the stuff we're due to life. Uh, as another example, this here is a re artist reconstruction of the state fossil of Illinois, the Tully Monster, Tully Monstrum Gregarium. Tully Monster has nothing to do with Sesame Street. <laughs> it is named after the amateur paleontologist Francis Tully, who collected the first one at the Maison Creek site, brought it to the Field Museum where it was described. And we are still arguing about what it is. <laughs> um, but I also think we have to give a lot of credit to our colleagues who are, do it for the love of it. They ask what amateur means, or avocational, some call them. There's a club called the Earth Science Club of Northern Illinois, which I am actually a, a proud member of also. And they publish books, for example, this is Jack Whitfried from that club. 
describing the fossils of Maison Creek. And they know more than I do about what's there and where to go and how to collect. So um, again, I'll just finish there. I'll mention again that I hate to be the flog by book and I'm doing it. Um, again, the book just came out. Uh, there's a copy in the back there. Uh, there's a flyer about it. Um, you can buy it at the book table, signed copies there. Or you can order it online through Columbia University Press. Give them the code CUP20, 20% 20 off. And I will now, uh, this, by the way, this is a, my favorite Allosaurus. I just think that is the best dinosaur art. So I'm glad to answer questions at this point. Thank you. And are paleontologists beginning to focus on a few possible causes of the extinction of the dinosaurs, or is it getting broader and broader in terms of the number of possibilities? I think we've pretty much settled. It was the asteroid or comet that hit the Earth. That is, I think there's almost no one. I, there are a few holdouts, uh, but overall, I think the evidence is, is, is incontrovertible and has been for at least the last 35, 40 years. But it's, it, almost every objection that's been raised has been put aside. So it was that. The mechanism, in fact, we just recently, we, we now actually have a fossil locality which preserves the day it happened. <laughs> There's a fossil locality in North Dakota where they find fossil fishes with inside their gills are the little pellets fell, that fell down when the asteroid burned up. It was just astonishing sights. We, we, it happened in the spring. <laughs> yeah, it, just amazing. Yeah. The extinction of the, these mammals, and as we're coming closer to the extinction of us, uh, I'm, I'm just wondering, um, you're saying that some of the uh, animals we have now, like the rhinoceros and all, we won't be able to find. However, some of them are like the elephant, they are dying in place. Right. Well, so the, how, how is that going the, to the, be? The, 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 what, we, what we did in our, in our, we basically had two papers, one on what won't be there and one what, what will be there. And we did break, when we asked what will be there, we broke it down by, by body size. So elephants and rhinoceros and very large animals, pretty good chance of they will have a fossil record behind them. But the little cute furry things, no. Anything that lives on an island, no. So, because the chances of getting preserved are very small. Bigger, the bigger the bones are, the better the chance that bone will be preserved. So this is a preservational artifact. Uh, little things don't. Little things don't preserve. I'm sorry. There's nothing wrong with what I forgot. <laughs> okay. No. The, 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 again, I, I always like to say, when people say, well, we have natural cycles and climate, and therefore, how, how can we have, have, have the, the human-made thing? I said, well, we're the ones who told you that this is what's happening. The natural cycle there is um, of the glaciers, there's about a 100,000-year cycle of this glacial advance and retreat. We know there have been at least 20 glacial advances and retreats over the last two million years. The natural cycle, as best we can reconstruct it, would be that we are in the downhill part towards the slow cooling to the next ice age, tens of thousands of years from now. However, because of the amount of CO2 we've put in the atmosphere, we've basically stopped that process. The amount of CO2 in the atmosphere now is greater than it has been for the last 20 million years. It's, it's, we know that the, clearly for the last two million years, it's never gotten above about 300 something parts per million. It's now at 400 and continuing to increase. So we are in uncharted territory in terms of the global climate. But again, 
the way we know what that history was is pretty much based a lot on fossil record. Hi. So how um, or, or when did the science of paleontology begin officially and what preceded it as far as the study? Uh, well, of course, people have been finding the remains of fossils since antiquity. Um, some of the early, the first published book on fossils was in the 16th century uh, by Conrad Gessner. Um, but the modern science started about 200 years ago when we started to recognize that uh, fossils had a hit, documented a history of life, first of all, and secondly, that fossils preserved things that were no longer on Earth today. When it got recognized that mastodons were no longer around, that extinction was real, that is pretty much when we could say at that point the modern science of paleontology began. And um, Steve Gould at one point said there were three questions we've been asking essentially since the 18, 1830s. One is uh, what makes evolutionary change happen? What's the motor? The secondly is, what's, is there a direction? Are we going somewhere? And secondly, does it happen gradually or rapidly? These are questions we've been asking for 200 years. So the mo I would say about 200 years of the modern science. I, used to, I still use publications. I have in my office the, ge the New York State geology volumes, including the ge paleontology of New York, and I have ones going back to 1842. And there's still violent, valuable information in those. Since uh, you know that the little cute furry things are not going to be shown in the future once they are uh, no longer with us, are paleontologists or another science taking any steps to preserve their history? Oh, the, the best we can do is um, collect, describe, and publish. Again, the, the way I, when I, I have a whole other talk I give on this, this very subject, the problem becomes is that if I publish a paper and the public paper is in a computer file or it's online, somewhere online or it's in a library somewhere, is that going to be around a thousand years from now, ten thousand years a year from now, a million years ago? The products of human technology are ephemeral. What's in the rocks is permanent. And on, so what we were asking was essentially what's going to be permanent? We can publish, we can hope it, it preserves. It's, there are things going extinct today that are going extinct far faster than they can be described. Partly because we don't have enough people who have the expertise anymore. They're all, you know, biologists are all doing molecular biology. Let me, let me get very quick. The average number of courses that a biology major in this country takes that have like mammalogy or uh, entomology or ornithology, those kinds of ology courses, the median number is zero. They'll know a lot of genetics, they know a lot of molecular biology, uh, they know about fruit flies maybe and nematodes, but about some mice, but knowing about the diversity of life, we really are lagging on that. That's a whole story. You may have already answered this, but what's the difference between a paleontologist and an archaeologist? And also, what is the most interesting or unique thing that you have found? Okay, great question. First, if it's an archaeologist, it's people. They're interested in the, the works of people. Uh, paleoanthropologists are interested in fossil people. There's a lot of similarity in, in, in methodology and technology between the two, but uh, we're interested in if an archaeologist finds a shell midden, something produced by humans, he may turn to the paleontologist and ask what's in it. 
So, you know, so it, there is a blend between the two, but it's, the basic difference is, is people. In terms of the most interesting thing I found, uh, I think the cave, I, I will just say the, the, two, uh, the finding a cave from 300 million years ago was just totally amazing to me and utterly cool. Um, you know, because of course it was unexpected. I think we'll have one more question and then uh, Dr. Plotnick will be joining us downstairs um, where you can chat further. Hi, I appreciate your presentation and I love the fact that you share it with excitement and with passion. Thank and I'm you. imagining that you are an absolutely wonderful teacher. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I'll try not to trip on my way out. And again, uh, if anybody's interested, there's a copy of the book for you to look at it on the way out. And I have yes. some fossils back there. I'll stand back there for a few minutes on my way down. And my voice held out. Yeah, well, you know, it's experience. <laughs>